Will you do something for me? If I can. Will you sing me a song? <laughs> How do you know I can? Because you sing when you talk. When you walk. Why, well, your eyes are... Why, they're singing right now. They are? Uh-huh. Well, I'll be darned. <laughs> when a girl meets boy, life can be a joy, but the note they end on will depend on little pleasures they will share, so let us I like New York in June, how about you? I like a Gershwin tune, how about you? I love a fireside when a storm is due. I like potato chips, moonlight and motor trips, how about you? I'm mad about good books, can't get my fill. And Franklin Roosevelt's looks give me a thrill. Holding hands in the movie show when all the lights are low may not be new. everybody welcome to episode three of the girl and gab and um, last time we looked at the palpable on-screen and off-screen chemistry of judy garland and gene kelly this time we're going to turn to completely different kinds of relationship and chemistry where we are going to look at the off-screen friendship and on-screen partnership of the diminutive pocket rockets judy garland and mickey rooney as always, we welcome our panel of three. So in 1940, you know this by now, Judy Garland introduced a song called It's a Great Day for the Irish. And from Ireland, we have the charismatic and talented master of impersonations, which you've yet to see, Mr. Conor Grant. Say hello. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. <laughs> great to be here for episode three. And next we have the adorable and bubbly master of the image and video carly jade many of you may know carly from her tumblr and instagram accounts oh my garlands where she shares amazing garland content and restores photographs say hello to carly jade say hello carly hello everybody <laughs> so i'm i'm sarah westers and i like to sleep and i say aim a lot so i apologize for that <laughs> So we'll start at the very beginning when um, these two child performers first met. They first met in Mar Lawler's professional school, which was a school for performing children who couldn't really go to a, a proper school, so they'd go to this school. Um, I was, I have read Mickey's autobiography, but I can only remember snippets. I did order it again, but unfortunately it didn't arrive in time for this podcast. So I am going to have to um, work on memory for anything to do with him. But before I say anything, I'll just open it up to the panel if they've got anything they'd like to share about that moment where they met. One thing that I would like to share that I uh, just recently reread was a little snippet on how, like, their first interaction with each other. And if I'm remembering correctly, um, on their first day of school, uh, Mickey got a comb stuck in his hair and Judy had helped him untangle the comb. And that's essentially where it all began. <laughs> I thought that was cute. Anna? <laughs> oh, me. I was trying to think of something brilliant to say, actually. Um, yeah, it's... Um, yeah, I don't have anything to add actually to their first meeting. I think it was just, I suppose, it was one of those maybe twists of show business fate that that they met at such a young age. They were both coming from the same kind of background. Um, ultimately, we know they went on to 
make films and we're going to talk about that um, in a little while. But yeah, it's just, I think, one of those great kind of moments of show business fate where these two pint-sized pocket rockets met each other. And they hit it off right away, too. I think it was like they're... Uh, they just had instant chemistry with each other. They, I think they knew from the very beginning that they were going to be um, forever associated with one another and lifelong friends from, from the very start. I think Judy even came home from her first day and the first thing out of her mouth when she was telling her mom about, about her day was, oh, I've just met this little, this, this, you know, boy named Mickey. And yeah, it's just, it's, it's sweet. It's, I think he was, she was 11 years old. And I think he's a year older than her, right? Two years two, older. Two years. She was 10. He was 12. Oh, 10 and 12. Okay. Sorry. I got the, the ages mixed up. Yeah. I mean, right off, right off the hop, they, they immediately hit it off. So I think that's, uh, I think that's awfully cute. <clears throat> and I did read as well, something that really puts into perspective the kind of dynamic that they had uh, at Ma Lawler's. I read that apparently they would pass each other little notes, like little love notes <laughs> that, you would, that you would when you're 10, 12 years old. The notes would say something like, like Mickey would say, oh, I love you, do you love me? And Judy would pass back, oh yes, Mickey, I do love you. <laughs> <laughs> that is very cute yeah, it's so cute that um we'll we'll talk about this when we get more to like babes in arms either on this or we might do it on the actual babes in arms podcast but that evolved into a little bit more when they were making that you might know what i'm talking about where they whisper things in each other's ear like quite rude things <laughs> just to joke and have fun uh, but yeah carrying on with what you were saying about the romance, um, I've got a few little um, anecdotes. Um, the first one is, which I can, I can recall me by memory, um, in the Al Diorio biography, Little Girl Lost, Judy is quoted in the um, McCall's 1964, is it? Yeah. Is it McCall's? It's McCall's, isn't it? McCall's is a um, shop we've got around here. What am I talking about? <laughs> <laughs> um, she said the first day they met him, they played something called post office and a boy would have to pick a girl and then they'd like, just, they'd just have to kiss them. Really basic, innocent fun, like when you play Kiss Chase as a kid. And um, he picked her and she says he was the first person excluding her family who had ever kissed her. Um, she remembers it that way. Um, I don't know whether she's um, exaggerated a little bit, embellished or whether it's true or not. Mickey, I think, did remember it slightly different? He spoke about seeing a sing at the Pantages Theatre. Sing and sing when the strings of my horse and was quite like blown, blown away. And then I remember a, a recollection from his autobiography where he said he went, he went home to his mum, says, I met a girl called Frances Gum today and she was kind of sticky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, um, that, well, actually, for anybody who doesn't know, Judy was saying Francis Ethel Gunn prize to Judy Garland and Mickey was Joseph Yule Julia Junior, in case we say that and you're thinking, who are they? But most fans know that. I'm going to share one quote and one other quote. I'm not going to share the whole thing because it's too long about when Judy first arrives at Lawless Professional School. It is from the actress who became, who noted become, she was previously Baby Peggy in the silent movies. I might need to put my glasses on, bear with me. It says, in 1934, Judy enrolled at Law's Professional School. At that time, she was 11-year-old Frances Gum, a frail child with a backstage pallet and enormous brown eyes. She was wearing a dress that was two inches too long and the black, gross game ribbon bows with which her tap shoes were tied were wilted and worn. Viola F. Lawler, the raw bones middle-aged, New England matron who owned and operated the school led this forlorn looking child to the piano. I felt this was needlessly thoughtless and cruel. Obviously, the gum girl was not a real professional at all, but the amateur product of some tacky small town dancing school. Why expose her to shame? Why put the poor girl through this ordeal? Right, she then goes on to explain how every other child there was a professional and, you know, well presented. And she said, um, 
Later on, she says, Mrs. Gorm, in true stage mother fashion, was already rippling her fingers over the keys. Frances perched her small frame on the grand piano and crossed her legs while the rest of us braced ourselves for the worst. She starts to sing, Blue Moon, You Saw Me Standing Alone. The, sh- the student's respectful silence became a profound hush as an emotionally charged and utterly mature voice flooded the hall. Everyone was stunned. Then she elaborates a little bit more on that and then said there was a spontaneous thunderclap of applause afterwards, which always happens when Judy sang from the time she was a kid till before she died. And then she later on said, far from being jealous of Judy, everyone loved her. Um, and it was me who insisted she be given the next to close and spot on the bill of our annual Christmas show stage at the Wilshire at Bell Theatre. Mickey Rooney was always the MC. So even there, they were working together as a pair. And people, including Mickey, were completely enamoured by Judy's talent. So there's that, which I really, I love that little anecdote. I've not heard that one before. Um, and I do love it because she's painting a scene almost like something out of Gypsy at, at, at the start of it with Madame Rose ushering in the main and they have, come on girls, sing out Louise. But of course, the <laughs> who's singing is Francis Gum, who's going to become Judy Garland. So, and then that that matches in, doesn't it, with um, a lot of people when she was that age would see this small little bit of a thing, and then this voice came out of her. So, yeah, that's a brilliant quote. Who did you say that was, baby Peggy? Yeah, um, a, a real name is on it. It's in art. It's in portraits of art and anecdotes, which I know you do have. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so the full, um, the full quote is in there. I've shortened it because when I start reading out, you know what I'm like. I start stuttering and rubbish like that. So I thought <laughs> it's short on it. Um, but now it's stop saying um. <laughs> I'm gonna smack myself every day and say I'm say it. It's what I just I, I read it again last night. Like yourself, I totally forgotten about it and just absolutely loved it. Yeah, it's brilliant. Mm. I love that. Anything else you just want to add before we move on? I don't think so. No, uh, just um, just I, I say no and then say just um. I know we probably will have a little discussion at some point in a future podcast about maybe the likes of Rainbow and Me and My Shadows and possibly Judy, the films about her. But uh, Rainbow actually does, I think, have a fairly nice, it's probably a little bit fictitious, but it does give a nice idea of Ma Lawler's school and her meeting Mickey. Um, it's, as I say, it's it's probably mostly fictitious, but it, it, it is that kind of, I guess, if you want to, picture in your mind of what it might have been like yeah that that's a good place to start in rainbow okay so we're just gonna um, shoot straight to mgm now judy signs with mgm in 1935 and mickey had been with them for a few years already his star was starting to grow he was not really quite the big star yet but it was starting to grow those first few months for judy were quite quiet at mgm she did um, a few short, well, two shorts. Well, actually, one short. I think La Fiesta de Santa Barbara was that film before she signed for MGM. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I think so. Short, but it was before she did her contract. Yeah, and she wasn't doing much except radio appearances, this, that, and the other, um, recording songs. But they were they were friends. They re- re- reunited back there straight away, and she has often credited him with being there and helping her through those early days when she was put through the mill with an image. Not that Mickey was always helpful with the image. We will touch on that in the films, but, um, you know, he was always there for us. So does anybody want to touch on that? Well, I think this was when they reunited at, um, at the school and Miss McDonald's class. I think this is kind of where Mickey, well, you kind of already touched on it, but became very protective of her um like their relationship had kind of shifted a little bit now that they're you know a couple of years older um and yeah he became protective of her even though he always loved to like mimic her (laughs) in class I mean as he would he's a clown right he mimicked everybody um but yeah they the bond really started to grow um in that class and uh Miss McDonald remembered them as like they were always, they were always so much alike and not only in age and size, but in their energy, like, and their readiness to perform at the slightest opportunity. 
And uh, she goes on to say that, like, while Judy was always, like, she listened really well, she never really, she wasn't a troublemaker. She was, she's all, she'd always sit still in her desk. You have Mickey <laughs> doing the exact opposite, you know, bouncing around, you know, being really, like I said before, the class clown. But when they were together, they would really balance each other out. And, you know, they just, they struck sparks off each other. And yeah, I mean, yeah, they're just, they're so sweet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah just to add to that I think like um, in modern times as well Mickey is hard to take for a lot of people I mean I, 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 I do, I've always loved him since I was a kid but he, is, he was such a ham his endless was too much even me who likes him sometimes like will you just calm down Mickey <laughs> but I think he was and he was hammy in their films together but I think her presence there as you said really sort of balance it out yeah i can only handle him in small doses i do apologize for <laughs> it's okay i don't watch a lot of their films very often because he like i mean he he's a cutie he's adorable but he has a lot to handle like his energy he's like up here and you know we need him down here <laughs> who's grown up with their films and love their films i i agree i can understand that and my mum she absolutely loves mickey rooney but she calls she and kelly a ham and other people so it's just <laughs> it's crazy <laughs> but sorry connor did you have anything to add no i i think it's he was just the, the a pure vaude, vaudevillian like that was both of them had a vaudeville background but she i guess she projected her voice to the back of the theatre she always was the belter whereas he was more bouncer on the stage fill the stage sort of vaudevillian and that's what came across into the films i think you're both right um he is like a little bit over the top in some of their movies um but it's that chemistry it's that blend of of the two of them together that does create some of the magic in the films yeah i can imagine back in the day it must have just been amazing you know for the audience to witness because love him or hate him, you, you can't deny how talented Mickey was. I mean, he could pretty much do everything. You know, he wasn't a trained singer or an he wasn't a trained dancer or an amazing singer, but he could sing and dance. Um, he was, it, his acting could be hammy, but he could also tone it down, especially in later in life and in things like the human body. He was a lot more calm. Um, I loved him in, in, the, in the 1980s and he could play instruments and he could write music. So. My dad always yeah. remembers um, Boys Town um, with Mickey Rooney. Now, I've not actually seen Boys Town um, in full. I've only seen clips of it, but I think he's a bit more toned down and a bit more um, real in that one. He's very good in Boys Town. It so was just discussing how he supported her during this period and Judy was a little bit idle. And I say idle, I don't mean lazy, means she wasn't getting that much work. It, she did actually get her, her big break singing to you, Mr. Gable, You Made Me Love You in Broadway Melody of 1938, which followed on from her actually singing it to Clark Gable on his birthday. And, Mickey Rooney makes a claim in his autobiography that he had something to do with that. I don't think it's true. I know Mickey was really not the most reliable source. Lisa, there's this myth again, we talk about myths about Judy, that she was a compulsive liar and anything she says was false. And she did embellish, she did love to tell stories. But as we were, we were speaking to John Frick, he said often there was like a little bit of a hint of a truth, even if she's exaggerated it you know, to the heavens. Yeah. But Can I just jump in <laughs> on that? Because, yeah, of course. Um, there's that, the, well, the, she tells the story twice um, on television. Uh, once, I think, on Jack Parr and once on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson about one of the, vo I, I was talking about her being in vaudeville. She talks about one of the vaudeville acts who threw up for a living. So mm. he, he, he would in, take in the kerosene or the gasoline or whatever it was, and then he would take in the water and then the fire would come up and he'd add to the fire and then he'd put out the fire by bringing it all up. And um, there's footage of this man <laughs> proving he actually did exist. 
<laughs> and you think that maybe it's just one of her little kind of stories or whatever, but that was true. So yeah, and you you'd have to see that's one of those things you'd have to see it to believe it, wouldn't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she was just such a great raconteur. And you know, she was never she wasn't um wasn't making stuff up for any other reason other than she just wanted people to laugh. She just wanted people to to be enthralled with what she was saying and to be hanging on to her story and like I said to laugh and there was always a little piece of truth in everything everything that she said and there's so many great Garland stories that are out there. I'm sure we'll go uh, way deeper into that in another podcast but yeah, that's all, all I just wanted to say was that it was, you know, she she always just wanted to make people laugh. <laughs> I agree. Like, I, I can't remember who the quote comes from, but I think somebody said she loved a good story more than the actual truth. And that 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 doesn't mean that she's lying. It just means that she's telling the story in such a way that it, she wants to entertain whoever is listening to her. Exactly. And I think it helped her to get through a lot of the things that she was going through. Yeah. Um, because when she when you when you create a scenario in your in your mind it's very easy to start believing it and she got through a lot of the the tough times by riddling it with bits of humor you know of course there's that famous uh croquet wicket story from the time that she was having a rest after east or after pirate and you know that's obviously a very traumatic thing for her but boom all she wants to talk about is, you know, the croquet wicket and tripping over it. And, you know, the nurse is thinking she's, she's that crazy. <laughs> um, but I mean, that's, that's just how she got through so many of so many, you know, trying times in her life was just make fun of it. And, I mean, if you listen to her tell the story of losing the Academy Award for A Star Is Born, she makes it hilarious when yeah. if you stop and think about it she had her baby the day before I think by c-section and there's a camera crew there's all this business going on in the hospital she doesn't win the academy award she hopes to win the academy award la 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 and then she tells the story and it's you're roaring laughing at her <laughs> <laughs> one of the to love her anyway we're going off topic yeah sorry <laughs> oh it's okay we're good at this but I was just gonna say um, it's like you were saying the other week Carly when you uh, mentioned the quote from Liza she's often like she'd take horrible s stories and turn them funny mm. and it's like I think as you said it probably was just a coping mechanism I also love and I know this is still off topic so I'm sorry but um <laughs> I love, um, Sarah, you might remember this, Carly. I don't know if you've seen it because it's on the BBC documentary. Um, somebody's, what is it? Somebody's daughter, somebody's son? Yeah, I think you said you've seen bits of it, didn't you, Carly? I have, yeah. Oh, you have. When Lorna was on that, she was telling the story about the tragedy book. Uh, have you, do, do we know this one? So yeah. she, Lorna walks in and Judy is sit, sitting there or whatever with like a big photo album or whatever. And Lorna's like, Mama, what's that? And she's, it's the tragedy book. And Lorna's like, the what? The tragedy book. So Judy had cut out of the newspaper stories about, you know, tornadoes and, and plane crashes and all these horrible things. And she'd look at it and say, you think I've got problems? Look at what happened to these people. <laughs> <laughs> I think I remember a little a, a piece of that. I think she also had, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think she also had a bitch book where she would yeah. just, yeah, about, you know, just stuff that pissed her off. And uh, yeah, I mean, I got Mean Girls vibes there <laughs> when, I, <laughs> when I read that story, but oh man. What a Judy. <laughs> yeah, did somebody give her, uh, like, it, it was like a diary thing, but it was like, ye old bitch book or something that was it yeah 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 <laughs> imagine if you could find if that was still around what was written in it now you know if you were to read it someone has it <laughs> <laughs> anyway where were we i was talking about mickey rooney's claim about he said it was coming up to clark gable's birthday i am i might be paraphrasing this because i'm working from memory now but this was in his autobiography and he, he was saying he feels proud. He had he was involved in getting Judy her big break. And they were walking to the studio or somewhere one day and she was like worrying, oh, I don't know what to do for, you know, 
forum for his birthday and he said um he said at this point in her, in her life judy wasn't the best dancer which is a bit of a lie because actually in broadway melody in 1938 she dances really well so that's another reason why i don't think it's true and he said um he said he said to her jokingly why don't you do a little dance sarcastically because he said she was no dancer back then even though her legs were one of her grace's physical attributes and she was like what and he's like no sing him a song and so he gave her the idea to sing a song for <laughs> clark gable which i actually don't believe one little bit because why does anybody give judy garland the idea to sing a song as a bit that's what she does that's what she did so I just thought that was worth sharing. Yeah, I don't think I definitely don't think that was true. Um, I'll have to reread the the story behind the the Clark Gable thing. She, I know that was one of the only times she fell out with Roger Edens. Again, we're digressing. Um, she wanted to sing "Drums in My Heart," mm-hmm. and he was like, "No, you're too you're too young. I don't care what you've been singing in vaudeville. You know, you're not singing that." And he has a bit of a, you know to do and she finally came around you know to his way of thinking and he he told us to sing um well he didn't tell her you know you must sing <laughs> he came up with the idea of you made me love you with do you mr gable mm-hmm. you know yeah. as it's on to the beginning i think wasn't that yeah. like the, the uh, that's the only story i've ever heard about the the singing at clark gable's birthday party was roger eden's involvement in it i I, I hadn't heard Mickey's because I haven't read Mickey's uh, autobiography, um, but I hadn't heard his his little claim that he planted the seed or whatever for her to sing. Um, I think I think I could be wrong, but I'd always heard it was a sort of a studio planned thing, which I'm probably more inclined to believe because, as you've said, Sarah, she was kind of initially kind of they weren't sure what to do with her. She said herself, you either had to be a munchkin or you had to be 18 or something. And she was in that funny in between phase in movies and MGM didn't really know what to do with her. Um, but he was Clark Gable was having the birthday party on on the set of whatever film it was. So I would say it was more MGM were just kind of looking for something to do with her. Yeah, I think that all all the evidence points to that. It, Mickey's autobiography, Bless on Mickey, it's full of nonsense like that. He claims he discovered Marilyn Monroe with a claim that Mickey Mouse was named after him as like has gone on for years as being true and it wasn't. Um, he claimed he invented some kinds of just for man, th- just for men thing for <laughs> And then we'll get to another story involving Judy um a bit later, which I don't think is true either. The thing that I did want to add though, just before we move on about that uh, about that um Mickey claiming that he was involved is that one pattern I've noticed with a lot of people that go on and talk about Judy is they always interject themselves into her life in some form or another to make themselves an important piece of her puzzle. And whether or not, I mean, some, some of them can be true, some of them not, but I've noticed that a lot of people tend to do that. The ones that, some of them are fine, some of them are innocent, like that was quite innocent by Mickey. And he didn't have to do that because he was an important puzzle in her life. The ones that get me the most are the ones who make themselves out to be the heroes when she was struggling. And I won't mention any names. You know, she was a mess and I, you know, I tried to save her, but nobody could save her, this, that and the other. That's the one, they're the ones that irritate me. Uh, no, so we'll move on then to their very first movie together was Thoroughbreds Don't Cry. And I just, it's a, just a little B movie, like she did a lot of B movies before um, The Wizard of Oz. Um, I always find it interesting. It's not a great film. There's part of it that actually amused me for the wrong reasons. Yeah. But we'll get into that when we when we do the breakdowns of it. Anything that I will touch on a few films of the, the things of the film, but I will, I'll, when we get into the actual individual breakdowns, the only time that Judy was ever billed before Mickey, because I think it was alphabetical. Because even though he was a bit more famous than there, he wasn't as massive. And I don't know whether they were maybe predicting bigger things for her. And I also find this the dynamic 
quite interested in that. She's not planning after him. She has a few little silly puppy love scenes with scenes with Ronald Sinclair. Um, it's more of a I, I like the dynamic in it because they're more like the more combative, the bouncing off each other, the fighting, and then the, the, there's obviously a friendship at the end. Uh, like a brother and sister actually dynamic, which I think fits really well. So do, do one of you just want to elaborate on that and the, the movie? Well, I love the, that movie so much. <laughs> it is, it is. well, aside from Girl Crazy, it's one of the ones that I do watch um, most frequently. I just, I love that she's just, I mean, again, we'll get through this when we actually do the, the, the podcast on Thoroughbreds, but I just love how much of a ham that she is in that movie. I mean, from the first moment that we see her, she's like sprawled out on a piano, you know? And she's just so cute. And uh, and I don't, Mickey and Judy don't have a whole lot of scenes together in the film, um, but I do love the dynamic between Judy and Ronald Sinclair and the fact, I mean, Sarah, as you already said, she's not, not pining away uh, over him and he's not cutting her down so that's that's good in my book <laughs> <laughs> I'm the same yeah it's um I didn't see it I, I was it was um that one and the second two Andy Hardy ones are the kind of almost the last films of hers that you know I hadn't seen um so yeah, no, it was interesting to see there because I had seen all their other films before I kind of did it backwards almost. So to see this one last, it is very interesting that that's their first film together and that's the dynamic in it. Um, I think she has a couple, she has some really great scenes in that. The one when she tells Ronald Sinclair that she's going to be a great singer and he's like, are you really? And she's like, <laughs> yes, yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> and he's frankly British in the movie. <laughs> It's cute, isn't it? It's very cute, very yeah. cute. And I like that, um, even though I'm not a lover of Got A Pair Of New Shoes per se, I mean, there's better songs in the world, but she does a great performance of it. And it's cool that she's like Maria Van Trapp going around with her guitar. I actually love that part so much. It's one of my favorite <laughs> too. <laughs> That's, it was apparent that they had good chemistry and thought of Breads Don't Cry, despite the fact that it wasn't, you know, a Mickey Rooney, Judy Garland film as we know it so judy made another film and then everybody sing and then she joins the andy hardy or well the hardy series because this the she came in at love finds andy hardy which was the first one that used andy hardy in the title it is both it was the fourth one in the series it was grown in popularity it has introduced a lot of starlets we'll discuss them all as one we won't do them individually but the first one she she was in love finds andy hardy in 1938 andy hardy was debutant 1940 and then life begins with andy hardy which we've all got lots to say about in 1941 and her screen persona really came off in Love Fans Andy Hardy, the vulnerable, you know, Pine and the girl next door. But I'll say my bit on it in a minute. I know, Carly, you have got a lot to say about Love Fans Andy Hardy and about Andy Hardy in general. And can you please start off with how new Mickey got off on the wrong foot, please? <laughs> I would be delighted to. Um, so... I was kind of late in the game, I guess, uh, in in getting into more of Judy's career. I mean, of course, I'd always been a fan of her since I was a kid, absolutely obsessed with The Wizard of Oz and obsessed with Dorothy. But it wasn't until much later that I actually realized that, hey, Judy Garland is a real person and you know, I really dive into this, this individual. So I started watching through her filmography and the first one that I saw was Love Finds Andy Hardy. And at this point, um, I had already become completely enamored with Judy. And I thought she was the most beautiful creature ever to walk the face of the earth. And then I see Love Finds Andy Hardy and I see Mickey just like completely cutting her down. And I'm like, who is this guy? <laughs> <laughs> what gives him the right to, to make her feel like that? And then, um, correct me if I'm wrong, because I haven't seen Love Finds in a long, long time, because I don't, I don't watch it often at all, because I just, I personally just don't like it for that reason. Um, but 
he cuts her down i'm pretty sure in their first scene together and then she goes off and sings in between and to hear this beautiful child sing lyrics like 15,000 times a day i hear a voice within me saying hide yourself behind a screen you shouldn't be heard and you shouldn't be seen you're just an awful in between that's terrible and i thought i'm like what why is this person singing this song like that's terrible for her to have been to have been given lyrics like that to sing at such a young age and at such an impressionable age and you know i just thought that was awful and at the time i didn't realize much at all about what was about her treatment at MGM so I had no context other than this beautiful girl from the Wizard of Oz now singing that he shouldn't be heard and shouldn't be seen and I, I just it got me started on the wrong foot with Mickey Rooney I mean of course I had heard about him but I had never really watched anything and until Love Finds Andy Hardy so right off the hop I was kind of I had a bad taste in him <laughs> for him but uh, yeah, so that was that was kind of my my experience with it. Um, of course, I know now that it was you know I mean, it's just a script, but I mean it does mirror, of course, a lot of what she felt um, in real life, and I had no idea about that. So that was that was pretty pretty bad. But I will say though, I mean she, as Betsy Booth always does, she does save the day. So she is given a level of importance in that film. I digress. <laughs> I'll come back to you in a minute a bit more about the Andy Hardy films, but um, do you want to add anything about any of them, Connor? Um, yeah, it's um, it, it, Carly, you, you make such a good point about the, the in-between song. Um, I think that's her first song in the film um, that she sings. And it's, it is interesting that, that the, these are the lyrics she was given to sing, um, considering she'd been singing songs like My Bill and um, Dinah and all these other songs in vaudeville and even on the radio she sang After You've Gone, she's already sang You Made Me Love You. Like she was able to sing at that age a song much older than her years and then I guess it goes back to the not really knowing what to do with her I guess at that age or whatever and, and having her sing but those lyrics are horrible to sing actually you know I, 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 I didn't hear the film version of it I had it on a DECA uh, compilation because she did, a, did it as a single for DECA as well um, when I was younger and it didn't register with me for a long time what the, you know what she was actually really singing about I, you know but um, yeah, she does save the day in Love Finds Andy Hardy. She saves the day in all the Andy Hardy films, um, you know. <laughs> but at least there's that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I had seen three of their backyard musicals before I saw the first Andy Hardy film. I'd seen all of them, but except Girl, Fra Girl Crazy, funny enough. So I always had the image of Judy Pine and after Mickey there. I was always aware of that. I... Once I read my first Judy book when I was nine, I memorised all the films. And so I used to look in the magazine for them coming on every week. You just get the, the TV guides every Tuesday, TV Quick it was called, and looking for Judy Got Home films. Um, so much more simple and so exciting. I remember that as well. I used to do the mm. very same thing, Sarah. Every week we get the TV guide. It used to come in the paper and I'd be scouring it going, where is it, where is it, where is it? And <laughs> You'd see, like, for me and my gal is on, you're like, oh! It looks so excited. You should have seen me reaction when Girl Crazy, um, but I'll talk about that because I wanted to see it for so long. But So I was so excited to see these Andy Hardy films, and I'd seen the... I'd missed one or two. They were used to be on every Saturday. Um, we, we didn't have a video recorder at that time, so... No, actually, that's a lie. We did. But my sister was a big New Kids on the Block fan. Well, we all were at the time. <laughs> so she would um, be taping the Saturday morning TV in case they came on and my mum's friends would tape the Andy Harsey films for me. And the first one I think I saw was, they didn't show them in order, in chronological order, but I saw a bit of Judge Hardy's Children. Then I saw the Hardy's Ride High. 
Then out west, it flipped it out west with the Hardys, and then the week after, it was Love Fans, Andy Hardy. I have got a crazy memory for information like that, but I can't remember what I did two minutes ago. And I was just, like, so, so excited. And I was aware of Judy's image, but I was still, like, I was expecting it. I knew Lana Turner was in it. I knew Polly Benedict was, was his girlfriend, but I knew Andy Hardy. Didn't really have... Considering MGM liked morals, Andy Hardy had no morals when it came to his <laughs> girlfriend. <laughs> and I just presumed that Judy was going to be one of his girlfriends. And again, it was like by the end of it, I do, it is probably my favourite one, Love Fans, Andy Hardy, and it is often considered the best. But I was, I was like proper, how horrible was she just treated in that film as much as I, I mean, they're not great films. My mum loves them and I love watching them with my mum, you know, it's a little sentimental thing. It's like how horrible, and I'd read biographies after how how somebody who was it, someone's daughter, found it in tears in a dressing room filming it because she was working with Lana Turner and Anne Rutherford, and she couldn't measure up to their to their beauty, and it was just like this is absolutely horrid and horrible, and even when she saves the day at the end, you know, she still he still got no you know interest in her. And as much as like Mickey adores Judy as a person, he even himself says, whereas we spoke about Gene Kelly, how he found her the sexiest woman in Hollywood, and he wasn't like, he didn't get lost in that idea of what was beautiful. He's a message, he was like blinded by the Hollywood idea of beauty, and he was such a womanizer that as much as he was protective of her, I don't think he did much help to her. Um, personal image i will discuss this more when we get into whether she has a cross on him or not later in the podcast but yeah i thought that was just again I, I can only echo what you you both have said but can i come back sorry no you're fine that, that you reminded me of what i was going to say um i came to, i also came to the andy hardy films very late in the game i i saw girl crazy i think was the very first mickey and judy movie i saw um, like that on the TV way back in the 90s at some point. Um, and I remember I, I how it, my experience with a lot of the films was um, we had a video player and my dad, who was a little bit technical, would say, oh, we can play American VHS tapes on this video player because they're different formats or whatever. And then eBay came around and I started buying some of the videotapes um, of our films. And Love Finds Andy Hardy was one of the first ones I got. But exactly the same reaction as we've all had, I think, with that one. So can I um, come back to you, Carly, about going back to Love Finds Andy Hardy? Because as I pointed out, it was the first time we sort of see Judy's on-screen persona on screen. And I think that is why that the In Between song was introduced as, I mean, even though Roger Edens was so important for Judy and always a right by it, I think he was also vital in bringing in songs like that. But you do have a recollection of an element of their friendship and how he kind of helped her sort of become natural on the screen. Would you like to share that? Um, yeah, so I mean, Sarah, as you mentioned, this is kind of when, um, I mean, Mickey really came to be someone that Judy would depend on and uh, really credited for her for her ability to appear so natural on the screen. And uh, so there's a quote from her that I will share here. Uh, this is from John Fricke's book, A Legendary Film Career. Um, At that time, I was hopelessly discouraged with my screen work. The first morning on the Hardy set, I sneaked into my dressing room to read over the lines. I didn't want to see or talk to anyone. Suddenly, there was a violent knock on the door. I can only imagine that. Vicky <laughs> uh, burst in and said, Jutes, I think this is going to be it. I think this picture is going to be swell. But look, let's have a sort of pact with each other. Let's never try to steal a scene. Let's work with each other, not at each other. That's the way to make a good picture. This philosophy put me completely at ease. And after Mickey left, I thought, good heavens, Judy, you've been trying too hard. Relax, don't throw all of your energy into every scene. Take it easy and see what happens. Well, something did happen. Watching the rushes, I saw that my scenes were more sincere and believable. I kept that thought in mind ever since. I learned from Mickey Rooney to be natural and to be myself before the cameras. 
And I mean, and you can see that very clearly in Love Finds Andy Hardy, and especially if you compare it to her earlier work. Like, let's take a look at Love Finds versus Thoroughbreds. And Thoroughbreds, like I said, she's a complete ham, but her energy level, she is throwing herself into every single one of her scenes. And then in Love Finds, and then of course, after that, Listen Darling and so on and so forth, she really becomes a natural. And yeah, I mean, that's, that's pretty incredible that, uh, you know, again, they, that's just, it just goes to show how much they worked off of each other. And as well, I don't know exactly when this was, um, but probably around this time, uh, Judy actually gave Mickey a bracelet engraved and it said, um, dear Mike, here's hoping we're stuck with each other for many more years to come. Dudes. Oh. Do you want to add a little bit about why they were called Mike and Jutes? Uh, oh, what is the story behind that? I told I'm it's just nickname. I think Mick, Mickey Rooney just loads of people either called Mike or Mick. And I think Mickey Rooney just used to call Judy Jutes for short. Oh, I think it was Jutes because wasn't he always in a like it's just his personality. He was always in a rush to get her name out or something, and then he eventually just shortened it to Jutes. <laughs> <laughs> how it went. And then sure, uh, I can see that being true. <laughs> Can I actually add one more little interesting tidbit about the dynamic? Of course, of course. So one thing that uh, that I always found a little bit uh, interesting in contrast to what's playing out on Love Finds Andy Hardy, where, you know, she's on the wrong end of unrequited love and, you know, pining after a, a, a boy that still thinks of her as a child. The very exact opposite was actually playing out in real life with Freddie Bartholomew. I'm not sure if you guys have heard this story, but Freddie was in love with Judy, absolutely madly in love with her. And Judy always saw him as her younger brother. <laughs> like, you know, just, you know, she doesn't really have that, you know, romantic feelings for, but does adore him a lot. <clears throat> And, but no, he, he was absolutely, uh, you know, ass over tea kettle in love with her. And so much so that they even had a secret language with each other and they would pin, pin notes onto each other's dressing room in their secret language. And the MGM publicity aides were like trying so hard to, to decipher what the notes said before each other found them. <laughs> so I always thought that was really interesting that, you know, the exact opposite of what's happening on screen is happening in, in her real life. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cute. I always love stories like that though, because I get so fed up of seeing Judy's image being beaten to death on screen that I just love hearing about anybody sort of being in love with her or, you know, fancying her. Um, yeah, I just love it. Okay, so anyway, the, Judy was into all that. The, the Andy Hardy series was a long series of them going to it. She did two others, um, Andy Hardy meets debutante and Life Begins for Andy Hardy. These were both film posters when Judy was a big, massive, famous star. She's already part, um, she's already at the time of Andy Hardy meets debutante, she'd made Babes in Arms with Mickey. Time of Life Begins for Andy Hardy, she'd made quite a number of pictures and she'd like sort of been allowed to grow up in Little Nelly Kelly. In one of them, Andy Hardy meets debutante, she does get to be the object of his affection slightly for a little bit. And it ends with the possibility that maybe there is a possible romance with them if they meet again. And then we get to Life Begins with Andy Hardy. Who wants to go? I'll go. <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> go, you go. If there wasn't anything more frustrating than Love Finds Andy Hardy, it's Life Begins for Andy Hardy. Okay, Judy at this point is a goddess, like an, like an absolute goddess. She's on the point of getting married, and Mickey still calls her a child. A child. Oh my god, that is the most frustrating thing. <laughs> you see her, like she's blossomed into this beautiful i mean she's always beautiful but into the like she's very clearly beautiful and yeah and he's still saying oh as if you were a child my own age 
Oh my God. And she's towering over him too, by the way. So it just, it just adds to that, that dynamic. I, I do like that movie a little, a little bit. There are some <laughs> cute scenes with her, you know, we'll go into that more when we actually go into each film, but wow. <laughs> the dynamic with those two in that movie, it just drives me into a blind rage. <laughs> <laughs> Conor, do you have anything to add? It's just that it's a very different Betsy Booth. Um, she even plays her a bit, a bit different in, in, in Life Begins. Um, I agree, Carly, 100%. Like, she is always gorgeous on film, but particularly we're coming into a real blossoming period um, in Life Begins for Andy Hardy. And it is... <laughs> <laughs> it's. I just think it's hilarious because she is the one that is living in New York, and it's just, yeah, like it's. It is frustrating when you watch it because she's she. I don't. I don't even know what I'm trying to say. Really, she is just <laughs> fabulous in this, <laughs> and he's still treating her like Betsy Booth from next door that knows the ways of New York and the carrying on in New York and Mickey's the small town kid who's, who's out there or whatever. I, I just agree with both of you as 100%. And even in Andy Hart and Mr. Debutante, even though she hasn't blossomed as much and he does pay a bit of attention to her, she's a sophisticated New York actress, singer. She's got rich parents. She shouldn't be pining over and following Andy Hardy around, trying to give him money, trying to do this. And he's like, no, you know, you're a child, this, that, and the other. You don't understand the worlds of worlds because I'm an adult and you're not. I know he didn't actually say that, but that's, you know, the mentality. <laughs> she should have had the most sophisticated males of her age swooning around her. And that's actually what Life Begins for Andy Hardy should have done it if Andy Hardy and Miss Debbie Hunt didn't. Uh, uh, costumes are amazing. They've clearly made her grow up a bit more. Like you said, Connor, she's different. She's snappy. She's sophisticated. She's she's witty. Her dialogue is completely different to the others in Life Begins for Andy Hardy. Um, he is still Andy Hardy. And I will do this. I will go into this more when we do Andy Hardy, Life Begins for Andy Hardy. But I do not see the appeal of the wolfus woman i don't get it i guess i know that's what was attractive in this that and the other back then but no it's she's not special to me and i don't like the scene with the fair coats because i like animals but there you go <laughs> so there you go it is the most frustrating of films and um, she just i love her hair i love her look i love i love her clothes sorry I, there's just she should have just been a whole film herself yeah, the way she was in that. <laughs> <laughs> but he's like, even the fact that he's still going on about her being a child or whatever, like that. Like she's the one freaking parking the car for him in the middle of New York. You now, I mean, you, I wouldn't be parking a car in the middle of New York at thirty-two years of age, nearly. <laughs> no, and what what gets me is um, she says she didn't answer me last nine letters. Now Betsy Booth is meant to be intelligent. Come on, love, you, you will get the hint, wouldn't you? You've got New York out there. You can go out with anyone. Just forget about Sandy Hardy. You've only met him twice in your life. Why are you, you know, like, yeah. I don't know who for him? And she does have someone with a crush on her, but it's obviously a young schoolboy or whatever like they used to do, you know, in, in her films where she gets to tell him off for only being 15. But I, it just, it makes... The, the, oh. I know they weren't, those films weren't known for the clever script and writing, but it just makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Even if she was still pining for him in the beginning, at least there's no source of closure to a character either. And there's a big, um, watch it, I'm having brain fog again. I'm in a proper rant now, aren't I? There's a massive plot hole in, there's a massive plot hole in the fact that he leaves it in New York saying he'll come back to and he's got feelings too and he's put on a photo on the end of the end of, on the, the dressing table at the end of Andy Hardy's Miss Debutante. There's a big plot hole in the fact there's no explanation when she comes back into it as to why he's completely gone off it again. Only the fact that he's now graduated and he thinks he's a man. When he's not, he's still a kid. That's the only explanation, but he doesn't even explain that. I know you, I know, sorry, I am on one. I know they say show, don't tell, 
but still it's not shown to me it's properly not shown there isn't like a little scene or anything or it's still just so oh, she's she's the child this that and the other and she's clearly like more mature she's saying you know she's got an evening gown she's got this that and the other there's someone with a crush on her but then there's no closure either to her character we should have seen they probably wouldn't have they should have known she'd never be in another Andy Hardy movie after that because she was far too famous for them and she was far too grown up for them. But there should have been some kind of closure. If he's going off to college, she should have had a end of, of some kind. I will stop now. I'm sorry. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> this is going to be the highlight of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Wait till we actually get to the dissect in the film. <laughs> and I do it scene by scene. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Anyway, shall we move on? We anything shine. else? Anything else on Hardy films? Just is it? Did you want to talk about the classification of Life Begins for Andy Hardy um, in the cinemas? Uh, yeah, we were talking about um, we were talking in the G and Kelly podcast how they cut food out and this that and the other, but a little brush of the breast stayed in. This film got into trouble um, with the censors due to a conversation between Andy Hardy and his dad about extramarital affairs, was it? About being or being monogamous until you're married, something like that. But it was a bit late in the day because Andy Hardy was never faithful, even though he was just a kid. And then there was the scene where the Wolfus, I totally forgot her name in it. What's her name? I can't remember either. I do know, but I've forgotten it. Janet Hicks. Janet Hicks invites him up for, you know, an evening of fun in her apartment. Nothing happens, it's ridiculous. Um, you know, even when Mickey Rooney tries to do a like really serious sensual love scene, it's not unsensual about it. And so it got into a little bit of trouble. I'll have to like recap exactly on the full version of it when we come to the film, but I just thought that was really funny. I loved the word of us. Um, didn't they call it unobjectable for adults? Yes. <laughs> In other words, it was objectable for children to see it. <laughs> and it's a freaking Andy Hardy film, like at the end of the day, like it's not like, you know. Hmm. It's it's as it's 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 as it's as it's as humble as or as it's it's like apple pie or something, do you know? It's not it's nothing. <laughs> I know. Crazy. So we've just discussed the Andy Hardy series and Judy's involvement with that and how it contributed to her partnership with Mickey Rooney. But the films that they're most known for of doing together are the what you call backyard or barnyard musicals. They may fall together, Babes in Arms, Strike Up the Bands, Babes on Broadway, and Girl Crazy in that order. I don't mind how you two want to discuss it, whether you want to discuss them in chronological order, whether you just want to talk about them all at once, or whether you want to do it in a back to front order. So I'm just going to put it out there who wants to go first. I went first last time, so <laughs> Connor, you go. Donna? Um, yeah, um, I, I guess we can talk about them all in, in one batch because even in That's Entertainment, Mickey himself says it's just all that changed was their names, really. The plot is the same <laughs> in all four of them, really, apart from a few little tweaks here and there. Um, yeah, I suppose the, the Mickey and Judy backyard musicals, barnyard musicals, they're kind of their own little subset I guess of of Judy Garland's career they're an important part of her career and she's I guess um there are a lot of people that remember her and Mickey particularly um in those movies I'd say um even today but I mean maybe we'll just touch on like the basic plot is is pretty much that Mickey is some sort of aspiring uh apart from girl crazy which actually is a smidgen different but more or less Mickey is some sort of aspiring musician or band leader or something to do with music. Judy is his pal, who is obviously the singer, and they want to put on a show somewhere and various little things happen along the way. They put on a little show somewhere in a backyard or a barn or something that, and really the show that they put on could never really fit in an actual barn or backyard. I think Mickey says that himself as well. And they generally become successful or whatever by the end of the film. And 
they normally are wanting to put on a show in the middle of the, of the whole thing to raise money for some worthy cause. And that's pretty much the whole thing, except for Girl Crazy, which is, I guess maybe we could talk about Girl Crazy separately because it's, it's, um, mm-hmm. it's the one I think we all agree where it, it flips the table's turn completely mm-hmm. in, in, in Girl Crazy. It, they just sorry to interject, but they still do like have a cause in Girl Crazy to True. save the college, True. even though the actual plot's a bit different. They've still got to get that in there, haven't they? Yeah, it's so. true. Yeah, it's that's actually exactly it. Like they're putting on that the, the finale of the film is the show to save the college, isn't it? So, mm-hmm. um, I love I do love the Mickey Judy musicals. I mean, we we mentioned it earlier. Um, Mickey. <laughs> was not, to quote Judy, our finest singer um, or our finest dancer, but the two of them together, their musical uh, numbers together, there is just something magical about them, um, whether it's the big production numbers or the smaller ones. Um, they're just, I don't know, mesmeric or something like that on the screen. Um, and Judy always gets her big ballad uh, to sing um, in it. Um, whether it's in Strike Up the Band, um, not our not our love affair, the one in the library, but the I ain't got nobody. That's the one, and in Babes on Broadway, I love Chin Up Cheerio Carry On. It just I don't know. It's it's mentioned about for me and my gal that some of that foreshadows her concert career. I think Chin Up Cheerio f- completely foreshadows her concert career because she stood at a mic in front of an audience singing it. I think she's stunningly beautiful in that. And I better stop rambling on here now and let somebody else jump in. Carry on rambling. I can't talk after what I did before. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got a lot to say on these as well, but I'm going to let you speak for now. Carly, do you want to add anything? Well, I mean, it. Uh... Connor, you summed it up perfectly. You know, it's literally a cookie cutter. They even have to raise the exact same amount of money in most of the films. And it's even the same, it's, oh gosh, the blonde girl who kind of looks like Amy Schumer. Like she, she's in as like- June, June. June Prieza. Prieza. Thank you, that's the one. Um, Like it's the same characters in every single one. Um, But it's, no, it's, it's, it's nice. I like them a lot. Um, Girl Crazy is obviously my favorite one, but I know we're going to kind of get to that one sort of separately. Um, but it's, yeah, I mean, it's, oh my gosh, I'm totally losing my train of thought. Uh, Sarah, you go. <laughs> Sorry, your turn. <laughs> I am going to prompt you with a few things if you can't remember what to say. I have got a few prompts for you. Uh, but I will, I just want to say as well, I love in these four films how you can see Judy Blossom with each one until by a girl crazy, she's totally outgrown them. Yeah. And the relationships flipped. Babes and arms strike up the band. He's still, even though they're girlfriend, boyfriends, pals, whatever, she's still pining for him. He's ignoring it until the end when he finally sees how amazing and wonderful is and that he's been a complete idiot. Again, like the one in Life Against Randy Arty, June Prieza was adorable. She, her gymnasts were like incredible. And it's quite sad that she dies in her 60s in a car accident, in case anybody didn't know that. Um, again, I never got it why he was like more interested in her than Judy. I just never get these. I never get the other woman in Judy's films. They're never as like beautiful to me. But then Babes on Broadway were a little bit more of even footing. They're kind of like sort of attracted at the same time. Maybe she is a bit more than him. She's more softer because she's like, he's obviously is still in it all for himself. She's in it for the kids and that with the show. But there's no other woman in Babes on Broadway, which I like. I like that little touch. And then Girl Crazy, he's just completely fallen all over it. And for half of the film, she's not a bit interested in him. And I just love it. And it's like presenting Lily Mars, her hair and everything in that whole look. She is just incredible. And it's got, well, again, when we come to it, we'll discuss it. Embraceable You, one of my absolute favourite Judy movie numbers with one of my absolute favourite Judy costumes. So um, I guess I do, regarding the two babes films, we are going to have to touch on this. And I know, Carly, you're going to take us through it. There is the unfortunate subject of the minstrel shows and blackface 
Carly, I know you've got a lot to say on, on this. Would you like to go through it? Yes. Um, so, I mean, of course, in both of those films, we, as Sarah, as you said, we do see them performing in blackface. Um, but something that I would like to touch on with regards to that is I want to acknowledge uh, the backlash that Judy has received on social media platforms like TikTok, Facebook, uh, that kind of thing for her part in that. Um, the backlash I'm referring to here is one in which groups of people are actually calling to have her canceled for it. Um, it, it does not help her case any that, you know, very left-leaning news sources like AJ Plus have featured her in their, um, in a video denouncing that performance style. And first things first, I, I do hope that those who have participated in that cancel culture are watching, though it's probably very doubtful <laughs> that they are, but what's missing in those social media posts is the context behind the creation of those musical numbers. Um, but I, I do wanna start off, Judy was on contract with MGM. And what that means is as soon as she signed her name on the dotted line, she completely lost her identity. The studio took over and created an image for her. And she had no say in, she had no say whatsoever in the film roles assigned to her, nor did she have any creative control at that point anyway, uh, over the numbers she performed. Uh, Judy couldn't even eat what she wanted, let alone have a voice regarding her career. Having said that, blackface was also a very common and popular uh, performance style in the 1930s. Um, and while, you know, while obviously it's horrifically wrong in today's standards, it was not viewed as such in, in 1930s. And society, of course, has evolved immensely over the last 90 years. And it's important to recognize the impact that that had on the progression of society while not incriminating those who were involved at a time when it was, where it was deemed appropriate. Um, I, I do want to mention as well, because a lot of these posts are, I, I see comments of people saying that Judy was racist and that's why we need to cancel her. Judy would go on to spend the rest of her life advocating for human rights. Some examples of that include her involvement with ensuring the Nicholas brothers were featured in The Pirate. Uh, both her and Jean Kelly fought hard uh, for them against the higher ups who wanted to cut the number simply because they were black. Judy also hosted a press conference in 1963 to raise money for the grieving families when the KKK bombed a church in Alabama killing four young black girls. Judy was not racist and she does not deserve to be canceled. I do wanna share here a quote from her from 1946. She said, when you get to know a lot of people, you make a great discovery you find that no one group has a monopoly on looks, brains, goodness, or anything else. It takes all the people, black, white, Jewish, Protestant, recent immigrants, and Mayflower descendants to make up America. It just wouldn't be our kind of America without any of them. Brilliant. Well put, Carly. And just to add to that is that Judy was not the only star back then who did black pay, blackface. Al Jolson was known for it, Doris Day did it, um, Fred Astaire did it, lots of them. And like she said, they, they had no choice. Stars would be put on suspension for refusing roles. That's how it was back then. It was not like it was now. So I do think all of us um, advocate the uh, Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, we're all quite liberal but you do need to know the context in what happens in these movies i mean the Anything? movies of of this era as well i mean you can open up a whole other discussion about its depiction of women um you know that it was their place in the home um you know there there's a whole other side to that that you can open up with that like it it is a reflection of its time um i don't Essentially, I, I don't think you can't rewrite history. It happened. Um, we can learn from it. 
absolutely we can move on from it but we can't hold I don't think we can hold the likes of Judy, Doris Day, Fred Astaire, Al Jolson or whatever to, to, to ransom by today's standards um, because we have evolved as a society and we have moved on. Um, yeah, that's all. But anyway, so did you, moving on to something a bit lighter, did you want to go into a bit more into Girl Crazy? Did you want to sort of do that separate? Who wants to go? Can I jump in with two little comments before we do Girl Crazy? I'm so Yeah, sorry. sorry. <laughs> um, picking up on Carly when you said about um, Judy, I suppose, spending the rest of her life, you know, talking about human rights and various things. She was asked in 1965 about her gay following or homosexual following um, at that point. And her quote was, I couldn't care less, I sing to people. And that coupled with your quote from 1946, just it, it, I think that gives us a real insight as to what she would have been like as a person. And I mean, don't forget, she grew up on the set of MGM and she would have been around an awful lot of gay men that were the creative um, forces behind so many of these films as well, you know. Um, and Sarah, you mentioned costumes in <laughs> there um, a few minutes ago. Can I just say, <laughs> I <laughs> love Do the La Conga from Strike Up the Band as a number, but whoever put her in that <laughs> dress. <laughs> There's actually a few of her, of, of her early dresses um, that I've got issue with, but I will discuss that in the actual film, in the podcast of those individual films. I mean, there's a fab, there's a, what, Carly? I'm the odd man out. I love her dress. Oh, do you? <laughs> I just think she just looks so cute. <laughs> I like, I love at the end of Dio de la Conga, she's very voluptuous here. And I'm surprised she is. She <laughs> past the censor because they blurred herself in for me and my gal, the operatic one, they blurred her out. But I hate that dress with the passion. I just hate it. <laughs> It does fit the um, the dance though, because like she's yeah. giving it all, it's like the shoulders are going and everything. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, and they put frilly knickers on her as well. Yeah, like, things around. But how did how did that get past the sensors? Sensors, the flashing of knickers. I don't get it. <laughs> right, so girl crazy, who's going? Can I go? On, then. Go. Okay. Yes, all I can say about this movie. Yes. Uh, from the very first moment that we see Judy, she's immediately brushing him off and in fact laughs at him in that delicious, delicious laughter of hers when she realizes who he is. Free, white, and lonesome. Danny, did you say Churchill? Churchill Jr., yeah. The playboy? Well, I... <laughs> What's so funny? <laughs> oh, goodness gracious. <laughs> and, of course, after my experience with Love Pines, Andy Hardy, and, of course, a couple of the Barnyard musicals, um, I'm just, I'm just, yeah, standing there being like, yes, you go, girl. <laughs> um, it's, it's such a wonderful film. I love how the dynamic really shifts there, and it's Mickey that has to do all the work to get her to fall in love with him. Um, and of course, you know, it's filled with so many great musical numbers. We have the Could You Use Me? And again, it's just, it's perfect the way she's, you know, throwing his, is it his hat or something that, that she throws? <laughs> <laughs> I just love the, the dynamic between them. They just they play off each other so well. And he's this bombshell, this goddess. And he's, you know, this little man. <laughs> <laughs> little man. I think this is the perfect spot to drop in the 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 um the story that he saw her in her white cowgirl outfit and said, "Oh, you look like a snow cone or something like that." And without missing a beat, she looked at him with his smaller height and his red pants and said, "You look like a rationed bottle of ketchup." <laughs> <laughs> I love love that story. <laughs> oh my god, I love it. <laughs> you got anything to add on girl crazy, Connor? No, just that it's, I, every time you ask me this, I say, no, just, anyway. <laughs> um, it's, 
my absolute favorite Mickey and Judy movie, um, probably because of what we've been saying that it's it's the tables are turned and she's presented as this uh, goddess to quote Carly that he immediately falls in love with or you know wants to be with and she hasn't the slightest bit of an interest in him whatsoever she couldn't care less about him um, you know and I think that the other thing about Girl Crazy is again Carly you mentioned it there the musical numbers we're, in, we're, we're into such a good score of 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 the movie we've moved on from in between and those lyrics to proper songs i suppose and proper <laughs> <laughs> lyrics and of course she sings them as only she could and um sarah i know you mentioned it earlier the embraceable you number is uh, it's just it's a piece of art and even though um i got rhythm was not um the best filming experience for Judy due to uh, Buzz Berkeley still being on the movie at that point and he pushing her pretty much to the point of exhaustion when that was being filmed. Um, it comes off as a fantastic um, musical number, I have to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally agree. And again, I keep saying when we do the actual podcast on it, but we will discuss how I got rhythm originally wasn't meant to be the finale. Correct. Until like Busby Berkeley got his hands on it. but. You said you love how he's fallen all over here and she's, you know, the object of affection. I love how it's not just him that's fallen over here. Every single male in it is. Yeah. Yeah. The, and I love that she dances with Chuck Walters. He was so handsome. You know, I've got a soft spot for Chuck Walters. And, oh, yeah, I just love it. I've got a whole load of... I've got a whole story about... Um, Girl Crazy, how I first came to see her. It's my favourite of theirs as well, even though it was the last one I saw. Well, how long a waste is. And I will, I was going to share a story of Strike Up the Bands, why that's sentimental to me, but I'll share that. Yeah, because I say, I've, I'm, Strike Up the Bands quite sentimental to me because it was the first one I saw of them. I will elaborate more on another podcast. My mum recorded it for me and she missed the beginning of the film, which she used to always do. She's always missed the beginnings of things. It became a running joke. But there was a neighbour who lived in our street called Lily, who I found out that was a Judy fan. And she let me borrow a few videos and she, she lent me as the first time I saw Babes on Broadway was off here, A Star is Born and In the Good Old Summertime. And she had the full version. Um, she moved into a nursing home not long after and eventually passed on, but I've still got that videotape and I can't bring myself to throw it out. So it's sentimental because it was the first one I saw and because of that story, even though Girl Crazy is my favourite. But I know you've got a different opinion of Strike Up The Bands, haven't you, Connor? It's my least favourite Mickey and Judy movie. Um, not the mu not anything to do with the musical numbers. It's this, I'm sorry now, I'm going to probably have to do a Sarah on it and go on a rant <laughs> in a minute. <laughs> It's the whole sugary, syrupy, sweet storyline with 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 Mickey and his mother in this film. It's I, I might have said it in a previous podcast. It's it's I I know it's probably um a reflection of LB Mayer and the type of films that he wanted MGM to make was this very wholesome, sugary, sweet. But I'm sorry, I can't help but thinking of Norman Bates and his mother in Psycho with this. <laughs> <laughs> too much I have to agree with you Connor well do you see the way he kisses her at the train station yeah he doesn't kiss Judy like that in fact he doesn't kiss Judy at all and straight up <laughs> <laughs> it's just a little bit uh... just a small bit and it's you know it's so so sort of I, I don't know what kind of a word you could put on it but I always think of this scene when she's sitting there and she's like there comes a time in every mother's life when her boy must leave and all this. And I'm like, oh, for God's sake. <laughs> the scenes are so dragged on too. Like yeah. they, they, they more than stay there welcome. <laughs> it's a long film, actually. They could have easily slimmed out, you know, 20 minutes of it. Like, it makes me laugh the way she nearly eats her hands, a fist, you know, when he's at the, in the finale, when he thanks her. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's a bit of um, over dramatic acting, isn't it? 
where's Mickey's father? He's never explained. Where's where is he? But that's the thing in all of their films together. One of them's only got one or no parents. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. Babes I was... Broadway, she lives with her father, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. His his dad didn't strike up the band. He must be dead because she he keeps saying, You you know, you want me to be a doctor because because my father was. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Mm. Judy's mum's not explained in Babes on Broadway, though. No, mm. and it's not explained why she's living with um, her grandfather in Girl Crazy, so it's not. Dysfunctional families in MGM films. Well, as they mm. say, Disney, well, Disney had something against um, mothers as well, so I don't know. That's true. <laughs> okay, anything else on the backyard musicals before I move on? One thing that I will add, though, about Girl Crazy, even though I'm I'm just elated to see Mickey running after Judy, um, at the very end, though, when they do get together, I just don't see it because she is now so outgrown him, and there and she's ha- she has all of the men at Cody College wanting her, and she settles for Mickey. <laughs> it's just, it doesn't. I mean, I know they have to end up together because it's Mickey and Judy, but she just so outgrew, out, outgrew her at that point. She was so out of the league. <laughs> I love the proposal scene as well, the, the, that the other fella, um, when he proposes to her and she's like, you don't do it like you're going to the store to buy a coffee grinder. <laughs> uh, romantic. <laughs> <laughs> what are you saving it for? Love that scene. Love it. Yeah. Going back to what you said, Carly, the kind of source of then we um, brought back the the other elements then at the ends where he goes off. So even though he's he's not going off behind Judy's back because he's in love with her, but you know the element with the debutantes, they still like oh she's jealous of another woman thing, and like you, I didn't really feel that. Didn't feel it was realistic for the film. No, they just no. had a note of jealousy in there, didn't they? <laughs> It should have been the other way around. It should have been like, but she had to go off and have a big ballad, didn't she? So that's why they do it. And Button Off for me is like amazing. So, oh, I love it. And I love that they put in the shot of um, your man crying when he's listening to her sing the song because that's pretty much what the audience is. It's heartbreaking. Yes, yes. Oh, okay then. So, We've just discussed the backyard musicals and Mickey and Judy were built into other movies together. One of them they didn't actually appear in, but it was As Thousands Cheer, which was actually a Gene Kelly film. Um, they appear at the end when they the big, like, what you call it? Extravaganza with all Hollywood films, Hollywood films, Hollywood movie stars performing. And Judy sings The Joint is Really Jumping at Carnegie Hall. Like any film, she guest stars in, she completely is the highlight, but Mickey introduces her. First, he's like introducing all these other other actresses and he's all like, you know, going on, ooh, yum, mm, woo-woo, and then he introduces Judy's cues, which is very typical. And she's an absolute stunning by this point. And then he introduces her as someone who he's been dying to me for a very long time. One of you two, please just explain that to me, please. I think that that was meant to be a joke, um, yeah, yeah. like an in joke that like audiences of the time at that point would have known Mickey and Judy. It was like Jeanette McDonald and Nil Nil It would have been like Jeanette McDonald and Nelson Eddy. Uh, the, Mickey and Judy would have been our Fred and Ginger. They just would have been synonymous with each other. So I'm just guessing it's a joke. One hundred percent. It was definitely a joke. It's got to be, hasn't it? Yeah. yeah. The only other option was it was just MGM and their work of fiction, do you know what I mean? But the one thing I do love about that number, this doesn't really have anything to do with Mickey and Mickey, but is that we get to see her in color the way she would have looked in presenting Lily Mars had that been in color because didn't she film that at the exact same time that she was pulled away from Lily to film that? I think 
Um, I'm always confused on the timeline with that because um, I know John the other week mentions that she was a bit thinner during that, like she wasn't for me and my girl, and he thinks it was filmed before. I know it was released after Present Lily Mars and Girl Crazy. He seems to say it was filmed before Present Lily Mars. I always used to think it was filmed a bit later, so I don't know. I need to double check. I'd have to double check as well, but it's definitely that time period whether it was just kind of Mm -hmm. before or during or just after but you're definitely you're right you we are seeing her in color as she would have been in presenting limar's girl crazy era yeah mickey to introduce her as cute while she's looking like that i don't know what's wrong with him (laughs) and her hair is fabulous in that as well we always talk about her hair but that's a good hairstyle and the color on her (laughs) We, yeah. we should, it's not on our list, but we should have a podcast on Juicy's hair, I think. We hair should. Style. But no, she isn't. She just like out of this world in that number with the, you can see the, the blush or the rouge, as you call it in America, and, and her cheeks and, you know, the red lipstick and the pale, flawless skin. And of course, the foreshadowing of that song that she really would have the joint, have Carnegie Hall jumping <laughs> later mm-hmm. in her life. I always get chills when I when I hear that song because of how famous Carnegie Hall would be would become. And even Lorna in her show, I loved that she took the joint is really jumping down at Carnegie Hall and turned it into the lyrics are rewritten, but it's turned into um, talking about Judy's performance at Carnegie Hall. I just I just thought that was genius. <laughs> Okay, so um, after that, Mickey and Judy went the separate ways for a little bit. He was in Listers in the Army, and then he he did a f- he did a few other films like National Velvet, Human Comedy. When he came back, he he wasn't really so popular. He was still like this. He was grown up, but he did, he wasn't the leading man type. He was kind of sort of treated how Judy was treated in the beginning. It was kind of like kind of a reversal. Or we don't know what to do with you. Juicy, on the other hand, was had become MGM's like biggest star, and she was going through a lot of personal issues at this point. She'd done the pirate and East Parade. She's attempted to do the Barclays of Broadway, which we will discuss in another podcast, but that didn't happen. And at this point, she was staying with um, Carlton Alsop and Sylvia Sydney. Is Sydney or Sim? Sid, Sydney, Sydney, Sylvia Sydney. Sims, someone else. Someone else. She's also carry on. Um, oh. on an intravenous drip of glucose, I believe. And she wasn't too well, but they were making words of music where Mickey Rooney was completely miscast as Lorenz Hart, really miscast. And they asked, could she guest star? So she was reunited with Mickey Rooney for one number with him which ultimately led to another number for her because she couldn't just have one song and not do an encore. But they performed A Wish I Were In Love Again, which was originally from the stage version of Babes in Arms, but they were thought too young to be singing it when they made their film. So any comments on that number? Uh, though, um, one thing that I that I read that I always thought was, again, just typical, what a Judy, I'm going to coin that phrase, what a Judy. Um, when, <clears throat> when Carlton was trying to uh, was telling her that Mayer wanted her in the, to guest star in this number. Um, the first thing out of Judy's mouth was, and I'm, I apologize for swearing, but get that needle out of my arm. I'm going to go down and do it. And she's just, you know, just again, what a, <laughs> what a trooper, you know, like she, she really did want to want to work. And I know that there was some money issues, or, um, that she was having around that time and MGM had deducted uh, a large sum out of her paycheck. And that was one of the things that got her into doing this is that Mayer was going to uh, give her, I think, $50,000 uh, towards that. So she's like, okay, let's do it. But I just love that, you know, again, typical Judy. <laughs> I just think uh, that with, with <laughs> the thing that always makes me laugh with words and music is um, she's playing herself. And it's set in, well, this point of the film is set in the 1930s. So yes, she would have been around at that point, but she's playing herself at her current age in 1948. (laughs) That 
but it's 1930. It's like a bit of a matrix or something like that. <laughs> and if she's playing herself, but Mickey Rooney is playing Lorenz Hart, where's Mickey in, in Judy's, like, <laughs> yes. <does she> not exist? <laughs> <laughs> the truth. Hey, you look a lot like Mickey Rooney. <laughs> 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 it's a good Truth. number um like i wish I, sorry sarah i'm after cutting across you no i was only gonna say the truth didn't matter in mgm's biopics no <laughs> no it didn't <laughs> but it is uh, a, I, I do i love that and there's you know i love just watching her face a lot during the numbers yeah. and she really whips out some good ones during this one <laughs> I love the um, when she goes, and I'd rather be Gaga, and she does this, and I just keep thinking the Lady Gaga every time. <laughs> <laughs> so, alas, that brings us to the end of the film partnership. They never made a film together after that, but um, they were reunited in 1963 for Judy's weekly television series, and Judy selected as her first guest, of course, Mickey Rooney. She said that um, he was the only one who could be the, her first guest. She knew it would draw publicity of the union, and also she knew that he would help calm her nerves, even though he was like, you know, wasn't the most calm person, but he must have helped her somehow. So I love episodes one of the Judy Garland show. It's probably in my top five, but let's talk about Mickey and Judy on episodes one. I'll start with you, Connor, this time. I agree with you a hundred percent. I love episode one. I wish it um, had been aired as the actual first episode because it wasn't. Mm. They weren't aired in the order they were filmed. Um, and because of that, there was a few things taken out and a few things put in later that I know you're going to mention um, about something filmed a bit later that was put into the episode. But yeah, I love episode one she looks amazing in episode one of the show um i love the soft hate soft kind of hair that she has her makeup is very subtle um she's got a lovely edith head dress on it's quite simple but i think it's gorgeous um on her for for, for most of the show and it is very sweet that it's mickey and judy back together um and I, I, I think it's it's often been discussed at length over the years on various forums and things when they're sitting down and they're looking through their photos and um, they get to one and they like say to the audience, no, we can't show you that, it's too naughty. What <laughs> was it? Looking <laughs> at my television during that, we'll show it! <laughs> oh, it's so frustrating. She says something like, you've just rung my chimes or something. Yeah. But I, get, I bet you it's like we said about voodoo. I bet you it's not even that naughty now. Oh, probably if not. If we see it. It's probably but what is it? Not. How is it naughty? Is it rude? Is it poking fun at someone? Is it an impression? What is it? It's, I, like, I'm only guessing because like it's like they're showing some of the stills from their films but they also show a couple of behind the scenes shots and they have that very she has that very funny line when there's a picture of her putting flowers in a in a thing and um Ju uh, mickey says jokingly oh there's the bonus mgm gave you and she says yeah but <laughs> 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 but i'm i'm only guessing the naughty photo must be some behind the scenes snap or something like that like of them and it's i don't know god only knows <laughs> There must be someone who was in the audience who knows because they showed it. Yeah, they do turn it around, but not on camera. Mm. Sorry, Carly, were you going to say something? I was going to say probably just them making a ridiculous face or something like that. Something totally innocent. <laughs> um, shall we talk about um, the numbers? So we've got You're So Right For Me, Carly. Would you like to say anything about that? Well, just that it's, I mean, it's a great it's a great number you know and i i love her taking off her shoes and oh, yeah. her bare feet and that would obviously become a, something that she did all throughout her career and yeah it's just it's it's a wonderful number i do also love the the little skit that they have in in that show that really pokes fun of their of their barnyard musical uh films and it's <laughs> 
it's just yeah it, it's it's wonderful it's funny that they you know, they're parodying them so they see the the fact that you know it's literally a cookie cutter every single film <laughs> exactly <laughs> And they put little elements of each one in every part of the skin. It's cute. I like it. Yeah, it's funny how she calls them both Tommy and Timmy in yeah. it as well. That always cracks me up. I often wonder, uh, did she do that on purpose or was she just muddled up for a second? Well, I don't know because he was Tommy in Babes and Broadway and he was Timmy in Full of Breads Don't Cry. So I thought it was like on purpose. Yeah, it could well but be. But I don't know. He refers to him near the end so he just rolls with it <laughs> and if you look closely in that sketch when he's on the piano it's the sheet music for you wonderful you from summer stock is there <laughs> you notice that too <laughs> right i have never noticed that i'm gonna have to go back and look now if i not notice that yeah because <laughs> i have that sheet music and i'm like oh that looks familiar oh that's june kelly <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So that's like the only time that Jean will appear on her show. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe they had that though ready for his appearance. Oh, Sorry, yeah. Carly. Right, I won't mention on this what else Judy did in episode one. Ooh, which blows your mind. I'll talk about her song at the end. We'll do that when we get to that actual oh, yeah. podcast. Goosebumps. Yeah. Just to go and check it out if nobody's seen it and you'll know what I mean. <laughs> okay, right. Talking about him. Any is that all you just want to say on the show? Do you go on the show before get, without going into too much detail and giving it away? Just, um, I think specifically for Mickey and Judy, the little outtake um, at the mm -hmm. very end. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, it's like as if the cameras um, were kept on after they'd finished the the show, and they're just talking to the audience, and it's only quite short, but. It just sums up, I think, their relationship. And it, it's very interesting that he says, you know, this is the love of my life. My wife knows this. My wives know this. <laughs> um, and then they, you know, they're just, I don't know. It's just, I think it's very telling of the affection that they did have for one another. Because he, he says something and she goes, let's do it again. I was just Yeah, that's... yeah it's so sweet it's like i said earlier the the relationship when we spoke about judy and jean it's their relationship was completely different to jean and judy's it was much more wholesome mm. innocent brother sister like yeah completely different yeah i'll just touch on some of the live performances they did together it's carly you mentioned her throwing her shoes off and she did it on the war bond tour in 1943 when they sang together so she wasn't taller than him she also did that in the wizard of oz tour so that was like the very first time that she started kicking off her shoes and it, that that would become something that she did for the rest of her life oh really? uh, yeah well i'm glad you actually mentioned that because i've actually my first dose is actually to talk about the oz and the babes in arms tour so um i jumped ahead of myself yeah so yeah you just said you didn't know that connor I didn't know that that's when she started taking off her shoes was on that tour. Um, Cause you're right. She's done it. She there's, there's a couple of different concert recordings where she says, Oh, I have a new pair of shoes on and they're killing me. I'm going to take them off, but she's done it probably in every show. <laughs> <laughs> you needed to be comfortable. I agree. hundred percent. And it was very, it's, um, it's, I think it's very indicative of the fact that she, was never the sort of Joan Crawford movie star persona or legend or anything that she was very down to earth all the time. And I, I, I think the whole taking off your shoes in her concerts, I think was very like, it was just a bit to kind of be on the same level as the audience and not be sort of the, you know, she's like, right, I'm just going to take off my shoes now. We're going to have a little sing song and I'm going to entertain you, you know? Yeah, definitely. Mm. But regarding the um, the Wizards of Oz tour, there was these actual footage of them arriving in New York. Um, that Mickey was sent with her. They'd film babes and all, but it wasn't really stretched, so they mm. were going to like plug it, but it was mainly to promote the Wizards of Oz. And they were mobbed. It was like the Beatles, wasn't it? Yeah. Before the Beatles. They were the 1930s version of uh, Britney and Justin. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> they mm -hmm. were just robbed. I mean, it looks so just overwhelmed. You know, like you see Judy, like she's brushing her hair out of her face. She's sweating. Mickey's sweating. He's got his tie undone. Like it's, it, yeah, <laughs> I can't imagine what they must have been feeling that, that day when they have everybody just crowding around them. Wild. I love the footage for just a kind of a sentimental reason. And it's purely because they arrived in Grand Central um, August 13th, 1939. And now we'll have to cut this out probably because this is me going to give away my date of birth, which is probably not a good thing. <laughs> um, but like I was born 50 years later and one day. Oh, I think we should keep that in. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe if I just leave it at that rather than actually saying my date of birth. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so what, what they did on this, they'd like playing, but they, they perform in between showings of The Wizards of Oz, wouldn't they? Mm. Um, until Mickey had to go back to MGM and then she was joined by Bert Law and Ray Bolger. But I don't know, is is it true, the story? Because I, I initially read this in the Shipman book that Judy collapsed one night because it was sort of like the first time the overwork was starting to like hit her. That was true. Mm. Um, yeah, that was also in the Frank book, actually, as well. You know, that was the very first time that she collapsed from exhaustion. He says that it could be from uh, low blood sugar, too, because at that point she was living off of Coca-Cola. So it very well could have been that. Um, but yeah, uh, Mickey really sort of swooped in and saved the day for her during that time as well. I mean, he, while Judy was receiving medical attention, he was out ad-libbing and clowning around with the audience to take away, you know, the, the attention until she was ready to go back out. Hmm. It's sweet. Hmm. It's terrible, though, to think that that's kind of the start of the overwork that, that, that they put her through. Um, you know, because, I mean, she's still only 17 years old at this point you know and they're they're working her this hard and to promote a film and she's collapsing like from from the exhaustion of it well i think they yeah. were 34 shows a week with mm. no days off so and they were doing appearances um in between when they just getting these lots of footage yeah the world's fair was yeah it? world's yeah. fair um there's the jitterbug contest is it oh yeah yeah, that footage. I love all the footage. I'm so happy we've still got it. Yeah. But, you know. but anyway, moving on. Then in 43, they were two of the stars who were on the War Bond tour. And I've just mentioned Judy flick, kicking her shoes off again because, of course, she performed Mickey Rooney. But on that tour, she shared a carriage with Greer Garson and Lucille Ball. And a little funny thing happened. Connor, do you want to take us through that? Yeah, so it was the Hollywood uh, Bond Cavalcade tour, which I think was her sort of second outing for the war effort. Um, so we're in September um, 1943, and it was a 16 city tour. And the story is that on the train, Judy Greer Garson and Lucille Ball um, all got together, uh, the three of them, and they wrote a, a song that sort of parodied the partners in crime, their partners in crime, or the, the partners they were known for sharing the screen with. Um, so Mickey Rooney, Walter Pigeon and Red Skelton. And <laughs> Judy's lyrics that she wrote were, I sing to Mr. Gable, but he's never really there. I'm longing to enchant him with my sophisticated flair. But every time I turn around, Andy Hardy's in my hair. <laughs> <laughs> and there was talk, um, in Ziegfeld Follies um, of that being an, a, a number for Judy and Greer Garson and Lucille Ball to do together. Um, and it was going to be set up with all three of them visiting a psychiatrist's office. Um, and it was going to be titled, I've Got Those Rooney Pigeon Skeleton Blues. <laughs> I would have loved to have seen that. I really it would. It was ideal. They probably would have brought the well, actually, I didn't think Mickey wasn't around then. He was off at war, but it was being funny to have them making a cameo in it as well. Oh, it would have been hilarious. Yeah. Um, anything you want to add on to that, Colin? 
No, other than that is pure genius. <laughs> <laughs> Another time that Mickey joined Judy on stage was at her Greek theatre show in 1965. She broke her arm, so Mickey, Martha Ray and Johnny Mathis helped her through that. Um, I haven't actually, it's still one on my list to listen to. I still haven't heard this concert, but I know you have, haven't you, Connor? I have, and it's basically, um, it's it's interesting to listen to it because it's one of those ones that is... um, it's not an audience bootleg that somebody with a little tape recorder did. It, it is a feed from the microphones on the stage. Um, so it's, it's, it's rel- I guess, semi-professionally recorded or whatever. <laughs> How it survives or who recorded it, I haven't the foggiest idea. But um, it is an interesting one because um, it's like as if they never, for some reason, I think we mentioned this in a previous podcast, um, about the the Melbourne shows and some of the talk of the town shows it's like as if they never did an announcement beforehand or something that that this is what had happened because the overture starts and Mickey Judy's overture the one we all know and at the end of it it's Mickey who walks out on stage um and you can the audience goes ah oh and you can hear it and he he says something to the effect of um she is here but she's got a broken arm which is, it's very interesting. And um, there's another bit, and I can't remember exactly what happened, but he's saying something about Judy. And I think somebody in the audience laughs or chuckles or there's something or whatever. And he fires back straight away something to the effect of, I don't know what you're laughing at, but a broken arm I don't think is very funny for Miss Garland. Wow. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then it's 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 poor Judy. I mean, I really do feel so sorry for her in it because Martha Ray is hilarious. I love Martha Ray. Um, and she's babbling on or whatever. And it was like, how are you feeling, Judy, dear? And she says, well, I think I need to go to the hospital, <laughs> which gets a laugh. But like, you feel so sorry for her. You know what I mean? And if, if you see the photos of, there are some photos of that night as well. And her outfit I think has literally been snipped this way and she's got the cast on her um you know so you kind of think oh poor poor Judy she must have been in quite a lot of pain I think she was yeah I've had a broken arm and it was the worst pain I've ever had in my life so I wouldn't be on the stage she's struggling definitely in it um like it's great that she had the support there on stage with her was it the day before that she broke her arm like it was really close to the show wasn't it I think it was that day because the opening night was the night before and then this is the next night so I think it's the day of the show and she even says in the recording I thought I was quite good last night actually (laughs) she really should have been in hospital she should have been god that's horrific it is wow Thank you for Mickey and friends for helping her. Let's do, we're going to discuss their friendship now. We've talked about them off screen, but they were known to have a lifelong friendship. They were periods throughout their lives where they drifted apart and didn't see each other. That happens with a lot of friendships. Um, and he was he was always seen to be by his side, whether professionally or personally. Like he presented her with her Academy Awards, but Oz, he assisted her while putting her hands and feet in Grom and Chinese at the Babes in Arms premiere. And he wrote two songs for her, one while she was alive, called Oceans Apart, which he wrote with Sidney Miller, who was often in their films. And, you can, you know, she did record that, you can hear it on her deck of recordings. And then he wrote one um, after she passed away called Judy, which he sang in a show that I went to see. It is, and he, I think he wrote it in the 70s originally. Mm. Um, that's quite moving. Right, they never had a romance. And I think there's no speculation like there was with Judy and Jean. There's no question whatsoever. They were like brother and sister. My mum used to say to me at one time, I reckon if she'd have married him, she'd still be alive now. But I think this was before she was aware of the extent of both of their issues because it wasn't... He was just as messed up as her at a lot of points in his life. I mean that in the most respectful manner. But there's a lot of... So we'll discuss the friendship and also there are claims that... Judy has a crush on Mickey. Well, I think that she she admitted a crush on Mickey to I think it was Ida Coverman. Like 
way early on in the day. And then right after she says, you know, I had a crush on him, um, but they never last. So she, I mean, at the, she was very known for going from from crush to crush and they they never did really last very long. And I think that especially with, with Mickey, what they had was, and he says this himself, was it was more than, it, it was more than just, um, what does he say? It was more than more than a love affair or something like that. It's they were a part of each other's souls. You know, they I they definitely didn't have a romance. There was, you know, it, there may have been a little bit, like I said, a little very fleeting crush, but I don't think they were ever serious about each other in that way. And I think in terms of Mickey. Um, I think had they gotten together, I think it would have probably ruined the the deep friendship that they had because now you're layering in a whole other um, a whole other thing into their relationship and that often doesn't work out. So they were exactly what each other needed. The best of friend, um, a soulmate, but in a different way. No, I agree 100%. I'd say that um, it's entirely possible that very early on, whether it was at MGM or back at Mal Allers or whatever, that maybe she might have had a crush of some sort on him briefly. But ultimately, I think it just morphed into the brother sister sort of a relationship um, rather than any sort of love affair um, or unrequited love or anything like that. Um, I've always found it interesting and God bless him, how Mickey got through so many women is sometimes beyond me. (laughs) Um, Mm. When we went to see the uh, Renee Zellweger film, my friend who was my age, um, because there's flashbacks to Mickey and Judy and that, she said to me afterwards, Mickey Rooney was never that attractive. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> they made him look a bit more attractive in the film than he actually was. And like how he married Ava Gardner. And uh, I, I, anyway, that's a whole other thing. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I do believe it really what, what was just a friendship between them, a, a, a very important friendship, a brother sister friendship. And yes, Sarah, I think you're right. They were definitely there for each other one way or another. I think, um, this business of the Judy Garland cinemas. I think Mickey had some involvement in that towards the end of her life. I, I could be misremembering that. Um, mm-hmm. And I've even seen a couple of photos of them here and there throughout the 1950s. Um, now, you know, maybe they maybe they were in touch more privately with each other than we, than we would know or whatever, but yeah, um, I'm waffling on here now as well. <laughs> There always was a lifelong friendship. She has, a, again, herself in a, in a later interview did say um, Mickey understood that and, you know, he must have knew that I was crazy about him. But like you have said, um, it winds me up. It absolutely cracks me up in the Zellweger film when it flashes back and it's like 1939 and she says, Mickey, are we dating? Yeah. I mean, come on, she wasn't that stupid and she was like, after all sorts, not to make her sound like she was going after the loads of men, but she was well into m- older men by that point. Yeah. And he's always says, oh, I, I, I think I saw her like looking jealous at Lana Turner and stuff like that because um, I was going out with her. But one, Lana Turner's denied going out with Mickey and also she was looking at Lana Turner because she wanted to look like her. So again, I think it might have just been a stupid little crush. I don't think there was anything to it. And I think they needed that kind of friendship um i honestly think those little things about a crush have been exaggerated like many things involving judy over the years and also it's almost that thing of why is it never that um a straight man and a straight woman can ever be friends like it is possible it doesn't have to be a a, a physical thing or whatever either mm. And I'm sure many people who watched our Judy and Jean podcast are probably thinking the same thing. (laughs) Come on, guys, there's not always something going on. (laughs) I will just touch on before we go that um, Mickey was heartbroken when she passed away. He reveals the story in his autobiography that he was on a golf course and one of his friends passed the news and he says he just fell to his knees and started punching the ground saying, you know, why, why Judy? He tells stories before that of how he like visited her in the hospital and 
he was a um, you mentioned the cinemas was it you Car- connor who mentioned yeah. cinemas or carly he was looking into creating a mickey and judy like theater kind of school chain i don't know how true this is but it was being lovely and there's the story that he left early on a funeral because he was heartbroken but i do believe that he did have a place to go to as well he was performing so and I know Lorna said they were going to ask Mickey to do the eulogy, but they knew he wouldn't be able to have it. So they asked James Neeson. You can see it in the newsreel footage of her funeral. You see him arriving and he he can't look at anybody. He can't look at anything. He's just marched into that church and, you know, you can actually see it. It's heartbreaking. Mm. OK, anything else before I close up? I'm sure once we get off, uh, I'll, we'll probably think of a million more things to say. Yeah, right? probably. Well, we can add them into another podcast when we're doing some of the films. Yes. Okay. So thank you, Carly and Connor, for joining me on this. And thank you for everyone who joined to watch it. Um, join us next time when we'll be discussing an overview of Judy's films on a legendary film career. And if you enjoyed this, please hit that like button and subscribe, subscribe, (laughs) ring the bell for notifications on future content. And you can now follow us on our Facebook and Instagram accounts, which are linked in the video description. Okay, thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.